intervention. Um, we're really excited to have Dr. Helen Barry here to talk to us today about her experiences of developing and implementing the Greener Adelaide project. Um, but before we begin the session, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of lands from which I'm speaking to you today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd also like to acknowledge the um, traditional owners of the various lands from which others are joining this session from. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and um, extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who are joining this session today. Um, so before we get into the session, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about the Citizen Science and Prevention Community of Practice. Um, so this community of practice was launched earlier this year as part of a programme of work which is funded by the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre. Um, briefly, this programme of work aims to embed citizen science approaches in policy and practice settings. The programme of work has been led by um, Sam Robotham and myself as project co-lead and also on the team are Ben Smith, Leah Marks and Pippi Walker as well as the work is being co-produced um, with a number of policy and practice stakeholders who are leading citizen science projects as part of this project as well. And it's good to see um, many of you here today in the session. Um, so the citizen science and prevention community of practice sits within this broader programme of work, which aims to strengthen the use of citizen science and prevention. So we hope that the community of practice will be a space to share ideas, expertise, and make connections with others who are working in this space. Um, the community of practice runs sessions specifically focused on capacity building with our project partners, but we also run sessions like these that are opened up um, more broadly to others who are interested in, in these approaches. Um, so we deliver these sessions every six months that are opened up more broadly. And I'll share details at the end of the session about how you can kind of find out more about when these sessions are running and what the topics of them will be. And um, so, as I said, this is our first session open to a wider audience. Um, so we're delighted to see um, so many of you here to join us today. Um, and we're really excited to have Helen here with us as well as our first external speaker. Um, before I start, I'd just like to also acknowledge the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre who are funding the work that we're doing. Um, around citizen science and prevention, and particularly the prevention centres funding partners as well, who make this work possible. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing my slides. Um, I just wanted to note as well that the session is being recorded, um, and we'll stop the recording when we come to the kind of discussion and Q&A section. Um, but we're recording the session over Zoom, and I also wanted to note that we're not just recording um, via Zoom, but we also have, uh, we're fortunate enough to have the talented Kylie Dunn with us today, who will be graphically recording um, the session live and in real time. So you can follow along on the graphic illustration by pinning Kylie's thumbnail in Zoom. Um, so welcome Kylie and thanks very much for joining us. We're really um, excited to have you here. And when we get to the discussion and Q&A section as well, I'll pin um, Kylie's thumbnail as well so that you can see how that's starting to evolve with the discussions as well. Um, so I'd now like to introduce Dr. Helen Barry. Um, Helen is a senior research fellow um, of the Australian Alliance of Social Enterprise based at the University of South Australia. Helen's research has a focus on Australian changing populations and the implications of this for society and communications. Um, and she uses both qualitative and quantitative research approaches. Um, and she has an interest in using innovative um, approaches like citizen science and co-design. So she's going to talk to us today about um, using a citizen science approach in the Greener Adelaide project um, and thinking about, you know, her, some of her experiences of using the approach and some of the challenges that she's faced as well. So delighted to have you here today, Helen. Thank you for joining us. If you do have any questions as we go through, then feel free to pop those in the chat um, and there'll be some time at the end for, for some discussion. So over to you, Helen. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. It's so exciting to talk to a whole group of people about citizen science today. Um, one of my passions at the moment, so um, for the last few years and moving forward. So uh, I just want to point out that all of the photographs that are used today in this presentation have been taken 
by our citizen scientists as part of the projects that I'm going to be talking about. Um, so it just gives you an example of the rich kind of data that you can get back from um, citizen science projects. Um, I also would like to acknowledge uh, the owners of the lands that I'm presenting from today, which is the traditional Ghana people, and that I respect their spiritual relationship to the land and acknowledge them as the custodians of Ghana land and their cultural and heritage beliefs continue to be important to the Ghana people today. Um, so just a little bit of background. Firstly, about myself, um, I'm based in uh, the University of South Australia in the School of Business, um, which is kind of a bit of a, I'm a little bit of a business fraud in that that is not my background. I've been at UniSA for about 12 months working in the Australian Alliance of Social Enterprise, uh, which is a research group that looks at uh, issues of social equity, uh, housing, uh, built environment, poverty, connection to community and not-for-profit organisations. So in that sense, I'm in my comfort zone. The fact that we sit in a school of business is a bit uh, weird to me. Prior to that, I was at University of, South, uh, University of Adelaide for 15 years. I have a PhD in geography. So my background is about population, demography and an understanding of space and place. Um, so this project is going to be loosely based, it will present some data from a project we finished last year, which was about citizen science for Greener Adelaide, which we did in, uh, funded by one of your partners, Wellbeing SA, um, who we have a really great relationship with um, through two groups, the Healthy Parks, Healthy People, team, but also the Office of Aging Well, who are both really, really supportive of uh, citizen science projects and the benefits that citizen science can give them. So briefly, we're going to look at a couple of other projects. One from 2018, which was our first pilot project, which was looking at green spaces and public spaces for aging well, which used a which was a, a very small pilot study to trial a new audit tool. And then another project that we're currently running at the moment that we're just in the process of recruiting um, for, which is around getting groups of older people to co-design an audit tool to be able to audit age-friendly cities. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. There are some other ideas there in development. So we, we have an, uh, a discovery application on age-friendly public spaces using citizen science, which was submitted, rejected, submitted again. We're waiting to hear about. We have another linkage that is currently under review, um, which we're waiting to hear about, which uses citizen science in relation to one particular building in the middle, in inner city Adelaide, to, which is a mixed use building. So it has offices and services, but it also has a retirement village on the 13th to the 18th floor. So we wanna get a better understanding of how people use that building and create a sense of community and neighborhood around a new building um, that is a mixed use building. Uh, so that sort of gives you a bit of an idea of the, the variety of stuff. We're about to put another linkage in, in August, based on this project around greener, healthier cities using citizen science. And the co-design project we're running at the moment is a precursor to a national and perhaps international study where we validate an age-friendly cities audit tool um, to be able to use internationally. So that's just sort of a bit of a, a background about where this has come from and where it's going to. But let's get started by looking at what exactly is citizen science. Um, so in recent years, we've kind of seen a really big shift from our traditional understanding of what science is, which is this public discourse about science. So I am a scientist, I sit back in my office, I contemplate my navel, I do good research, and your engagement is that you come along and listen to me speak, a bit like we're doing now, that I just feed you results from science. But we've moved away from that in recent year to this idea of public understanding of science. 
and public engagement in science. So that is more about creating a collaborative environment where we do science together. And so we look at that collaborative engagement and we understand that within our team to understand citizen science as a partnership between professional researchers who have knowledge and experience and skills that they can pass on and volunteers who implement some of the tasks that are traditionally done by researchers. So that cooperation kind of serves two goals. First, it should create new scientific insights. So it's not just about training scientists, it's about producing science together. And the second thing, and it's usually it's around research or science that a professional researcher couldn't manage to generate on their own. So it's about depth of experience or hard to reach data or comprehensive data about something that you couldn't possibly do on your own. The second part of that partnership is that it should produce an educational outcome for all the participants who are involved and increase scientific interest. So you do it about engaging community in science as much as you do about producing good science out the other end. So we tend to use a cooperative approach and within that there are three kind of models that people use. One is a contributive model and that means that you get volunteers to collect your data and it's also called crowdsourcing data. So that is one sort of limited aspect. We think it's one dimension of citizen scientists is that you can get a whole lot of people to collect data for you. Um, and that means that you can collect more data than you could as a researcher on your own. Just noting that that's different than me collecting data about you. So it's not about me just putting a survey out and getting you to contribute your responses. That's just traditional science. This is about people collecting data on your behalf. So they are interpreting, interpreting what you want and they are doing the data collection for you. We then we get into things which are collaborative models of research, which is where you would involve your citizen scientists, not only in collecting the data, but maybe in cleaning and analyzing and interpreting that data. So it takes it to the next level. You get them back in and you say, what do you think this means? And we have a lot of people who said, great to collect your data, but what I really want to do is get in and play with the data. I'm, I have a lot of experience in IT or I have a lot of experience in, in using data sets and I would like to be able to help you go beyond that. Even for the people that maybe don't want to take it that far, we always get them back to take part in workshops, in understanding the data, in interviewing them about their experiences in collecting data. So you engage them at that next level around the science project. The final interpretation of this cooperative approach is co-created projects, which is kind of my new passion in that you involve a group of citizen science right from the beginning. We have a question about what? What should our research questions be? How could we design an audit tool? Where would we collect that data? How long do you think we should collect that data? So they are involved and engaged right from the beginning as co-creators. So why would you use citizen science? Well, citizen science is pretty well established in the natural sciences. So, but we don't see a lot of evidence in social sciences. We're starting to see it in health science, um, but in the social science and particularly in the built environment or in the fields of gerontology, which are where my two interests overlap, we don't see a lot of it at all. So for example, this, this is a, a dive I did into the Australian Citizen Science Association website. For anybody who's interested, I suggest you go and have a look. This was a couple of years ago now, there were 615 projects listed. I think I had a quick dive in the other day and there were over a thousand citizen science projects. If you're doing citizen science, you can put your project up there if you're a member, which is a great way to attract other people who might be interested in taking part. Of those 615 projects at this time, seven 
I would relate as social science projects. So you can see it's a really tiny aspect of what citizen science did. So there are thousands out there where you can count yellow spotted fairy toads or sea grasses or how much pollution on the beach or weeds in national parks, all of those. Astronomy is a big area where they use citizen science a lot. This is usually about collecting data, but it's also about engaging passionate people in a particular project. So that's a natural fit for the natural sciences, which is pretty empirical in nature. So did you see a yellow spotted fairy toad or didn't you? This is what one looks like. Go out, find them, tick where you found them. It's fairly empirical. You, you saw one or you didn't saw one see one, whereas social science tends to be more constructive in nature. So there's lots of shades of grey, there's lots of opinions, there's perceptions, there will always be diversity in the data that you're collecting. And the tricky part is understanding, interpreting that diversity and supporting pluralist answers to things. So these people found this, but these people found this, neither of them are wrong. Um, it's just a matter of interpreting that data. So that can help us, citizen science can help us illuminate those shades of grey, that diversity of opinion. But the power is in the volunteers. The power is in the number of people, the amount of data that you can collect. So for example, if you go to the ABS, ABC website today, there is an article there about the University of New South Wales and a citizen science project where they've been counting birds around the world and they had 600,000 volunteers collecting data for them. So you can imagine the amount of data that they have collected about birds around the world just from a citizen science project. So from my point of view, I can collect a whole lot more data in a shorter amount of time than I ever could on my own or with a research team. Um, I can collect richer data and it's cheaper for me to collect that data. Not to say that we don't acknowledge and reward citizen science for the work they do, but I don't have to pay them $50 an hour to go out and do it. So I can achieve much better results as part of a cooperative research group than I ever could on my own. So the broad, broad arching aim of our recent studies, and I've kind of combined them here, was to develop, trial and validate an audit tool that could be used by community members as trained citizen science, training is important, to evaluate green spaces and built environment for different purposes. So all the audit tools that we have created contain both quantitative and qualitative data in order to understand the relationship of community members to their neighbourhood environments. And the key to that is engaging older people in auditing their own life spaces, their own neighbourhoods and communities. So we don't get them to go out and order all the parks and gardens in their neighbourhood. We get them to do audits as part of their everyday life so that we can get a better understanding of how they use their neighbourhoods, what they use their neighbourhoods for, how far their neighbourhoods stretch, how they get to different places. So the key for us is as part of everyday life. And the beauty of the audit tool approach is that it can be adapted to suit different lines of inquiry. So we have a basic audit tool that we work from, but we can focus it in different ways. So we could take out data on social spaces only, on active travel, how did people get places, on how people perceive health within their neighbourhood, on how they perceive nature within their neighbourhoods, just by tweaking some questions or filtering out the different uh, responses that people give us. So as I said, these were pilots, some, and I've just got some examples here of the last project we completed, the Greener Adelaide project, um, to give you an understanding. The thing you'll note is that the numbers are small. That's partly because this is a pilot and we didn't want bigger numbers. But the second thing is that you don't need a lot of citizen scientists to create a lot of data. So in the last project, we had 44 citizen scientists who worked through us from the training onwards. So we started with 93. 
We wanted 100 citizen scientists. We recruited 93. Uh, we, recruitment is through local governments. Local governments are amazing for this work because they are so connected to their local communities. They have great social media. They have great databases of volunteers and group memberships. They understand their communities and they are interested in the data that you get back about their neighborhoods. So we always offer a little carrot. So for this project, we had nine LGAs involved. Of those nine LGAs, what we said to them was, you find us 10 to 12 citizen scientists and we will give you a report of your LGA's um, data benchmark against the whole project. So each of those nine LGA's got their own individual report based on feedback from how citizen scientists had used the green spaces in their LGA. And then we were able to benchmark that, I guess, against the Greater Adelaide data as well. So as I said, we started with 93. Our biggest downfall for this project was we were recruiting in February last year. So we got hit with COVID about halfway through our training and everything got locked down. So we had 93, we had 73 of those signed up for training. 51 completed their training either online or face-to-face -face or over the phone. And of those, 44 continued to be citizen scientists for, this, for the eight to 10 weeks of data collection. Out of that, we got over 650 audits completed. And that was during pre-COVID and COVID lockdown period. So we didn't, if we'd had a 400, we would have been looking at 1500 to 2000 audits, which then starts to be a lot of data. This was a, a $15,000 project. So we didn't have a lot of money left over to do the analysis and all the other work. So we were quite happy with that. You will see that overwhelmingly people were female, they were older, um, they lived with a partner but didn't have children, um, and they'd spent a lot of time in their local neighbourhoods, and about half were not in the labour force. So what this tells you is that you tend to attract people with time to be engaged in citizen science projects. You'll also tend to attract people who are passionate about what you're doing. Now, as a scientist, that does two things. It biases our sample. We know that from the start, that we've got passionate people and we tend to have got people that have the time to do this work. So you've got to do a little bit more work if you don't want to buy a sample. Um, but we do find that the breadth of experience, the fact that we're mainly looking at how older people use their environment means that we're not feeling um, that that's an issue. Um, but it could be an issue if you're trying to critique something and you have a sample of people who are very passionate about that um, experience. So you do need to think very carefully about that. Um, as I said, training and, uh, is critical to this project, uh, to any citizen science project. So recruitment was through our partners. As I said, LGAs are amazing for this work. Smartphones have probably made the biggest difference to how people can do citizen science. And we always, always offer an alternative. So we always say, if you do not wish to use your smartphone or you do not have a smartphone, here is a booklet, here is a disposable digital camera for you to take photographs. You can still do the citizen science project. But to date, out of three citizen science projects, we haven't had one person who hasn't had a smartphone. And that's people from their mid eighties down to their thirties. Everybody would much prefer to do it on their smartphone. Um, the audit tool, which I'll show you in a minute, acts like an app. It's not, we didn't produce an app. I would say there is no need to produce an app. We just had a web link that looks like an app that we upload onto their phones. Training is absolutely critical for this um, type of work. It creates good citizen scientists. They need to understand what citizen science is, what the ethical implications of what they're doing, how to quality control what they're doing, how to use the app correctly. So I would say you cannot do, you cannot just email out and say, 
here's a link, take part in our citizen science project and away you go. To me, it is really critical that you train citizen scientists to understand what it means to be a good scientist. Now that training we've found can be face-to-face. -face. You can do it over the phone. You can do it using an online manual. We are currently working at creating YouTube training videos so that people can just watch the YouTube video and do the training. Um, any of those methods works really, really well. You can be flexible and mix it up. Some people want to come in, some people are too busy. You can just ring them and talk them through it over the phone. But they need to get the consistent message about what is good science before they begin. And there are ethical things to do. So for example, the audit tool we use allows you to take photographs. There is a whole lot of stuff in there about, please do not fake photographs of strangers so that we can recognize their face. So photos like this one that you see on this slide is good because you can't see anybody's face. You can't recognize anybody. Well, I can because I know who they all are, but you can't recognize any of those people. The other thing is don't take a photo of the front of your house with your street or street number identifiable so that your data is protected. You remain anonymous and the people who haven't agreed to be part of this research are also anonymous. So don't line the grandchildren up on a park bench and take a photograph. Don't take a photograph of a family picnic. Um, it's okay to take a photograph of your dog, things like that. So we, we try to get them to understand what it's important. The other thing we do at training is we collect background data, demographic data. So you will see in a minute with the audit tool, we're able to link their audits to their background demographic data so that we know who's done the audit, where they live, how they normally get about, what their health is like, all of that background stuff. They just have to give us the ones. The other thing that we've learned um, from doing these is to provide a cheat sheet that people can use because people will forget. You'll take them through training and then they'll go, I don't know how to upload my location or I forgot how to put a photograph in or how to put it, put the audits in later during Wi-Fi. So you can you can provide all those tips and tricks um, in a cheat sheet that people can take with them or refer to uh, on a regular basis. The other thing that is critical is we don't just train them and send them off and say, see you in six weeks when you've collected all our data. It's an ongoing engagement. We want them to feel like they're part of a team. We want them to feel supported that they can ring up at any time or email us and say, I don't think I've understood how to do this correctly, or are you able to look at my data? Is this what you're looking for? So we were able to have that ongoing engagement. The fact that people are using smartphones is great because we have their phone numbers and we text them on a regular basis and say, you're doing a terrific job. We can see you've done 40 audits so far, or hey, everybody in a group audit, we've just reached, you know, audit number 200 you're doing a fantastic job and you'll see in a little while how that helps you with data collection but what it really does is make people feel that they are part of a community in collecting data so here is a quick example of our audit tool we use a platform called esri um, an esri platform called survey one two three it's if you have an ESRI account, which most universities do, and a lot of government departments do, that means you have access to Survey123. So there you go, it's not gonna cost you very much to use it. Um, it was originally designed for engineers to be able to go out in the field and collect field notes on different sites they were going to. So instead of having to write some notes and come back to the office and fill out all the paperwork, they were able to do it as they went along, upload a couple of photographs of something to show it was working or what was wrong, and then all their data was collected as they went around. It soon became obvious that this was a really great research tool. Um, and what it allows you to do, what we like about it, you can see in question two here, is that you can geocode where people are when they do an audit. And so for us, looking at green spaces and neighborhoods, that became critical. And I'll show you a little bit of data lady about how that, how critical that becomes in being able to ass, assess your data better. You can see the first question is, what is your ID? 
So we're getting, that's how we link every audit they do back to the data that they, uh, back to their demographic data. And then you have a whole series of questions that they work through. A lot of those are like it scales or tick the boxes. So it's quant stuff that you're collecting, but there are lots of opportunities for qualitative data. So you can upload two photographs, you can have open text boxes to talk about comments. And at the end, we always have a large, is there anything else you want to tell us about this space um, comment? And you'll see some of those comments in a little minute. Once they've finished that survey, that audit, they press submit. This is the exciting thing. We get that data straight away. So we're not waiting for them to bring post back their surveys to return things to us. We get real time data, time stamped, date stamped. We can check that against weather. We can check that against traffic noise. We can check that against all sorts of other things if we wanted to external data to link that up. But for us, it tells us when people were out, what days of the week they were out. So you can check your data on how many people access green space on Mondays compared to Sundays, um, whether families are more likely to be out in the morning or whether older people go out at night, all of those kinds of things you can start to check from the timestamp data. To us, the key thing was that most of these audits take less than seven minutes to complete. So we are not, if you're walking your dog around the block, we are not getting you to stand there for 20 minutes filling out a survey. They're very quick to do. And people have told us that once they got used to doing them, they can complete them in under five minutes. So they're more inclined to go out and audit spaces because they're just doing it as part of their everyday life. They're not having to do it um, you know, it's not taking up a lot of their time. So here is an example of the type of uh, data we get in the back end, which shows us how many surveys those 44 people did on a daily basis. So along the bottom axis, you've got the dates, and then we can see the number of audits. So you can see the first couple of days, we've trained a group of people and they've all gone out and they've tried it. Uh, and then we train more people and they've gone out and they've tried it. And uh, so it goes on. The critical things are where you see these dips here, which is where kind of people, and we all know this if we've done surveys, people peter off. They kind of, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they forget that they're supposed to be doing them. Um, so this is where we send a little text message and say, aren't you all doing a great job? And then you think, oh, I'm supposed to be going out and auditing things, so away they go again. So you can actually sustain interest in data collection for longer because you're mapping how the data collection is going on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you could produce this on an hour-to-hour -hour basis if you really wanted to, but it just gives us that little bit of depth of understanding about um, how the data collection is progressing. The other thing I said, it comes up in real time. So I could have a researcher sitting in an office looking at the Esri map and little red dots pop up every time someone completes an audit. So we can see where audits have been conducted. And if I press on an audit, so in this case, that blue dot is the one that the information you see on the left hand side. And that is the answers to this particular survey. Uh, so we can see all the answers to every survey on the map at any one time. Um, there, are, there is the ability for you to provide a login to citizen scientists so that they can also see which spaces have been audited. So they can't interfere and change that data, but they can see which spaces they've audited and which spaces other people have audited. So they could go and look around and say, hey, no one's done the Botanic Park yet. I think I'll go and audit the Botanic Park because that's part of my regular um, neighbourhood. Or they might look and say, someone else has done a park around the corner for me. I wonder if my interpretation would match their interpretation. And another, it's another way to keep people engaged. So as I said, people can upload photographs. So for that blue dot you saw on the last map, here are the photographs and the comment 
that went with that data. So we get the qualitative experience as well as the quantitative data about that particular site. Um, and we know exactly where it is and what they were thinking about when they were there. What was the bits that attracted them? We always encourage people to tell us the negative things about spaces as well as the positive things. Um, generally, people like to tell you what they like about a space, but we did have a couple of people um, in the first audit particular one was obsessed with bike tracks and everything that was wrong as a keen cyclist, everything that was wrong with bike tracks. So we did get a lot of information. This is another reason why LGAs like it. You feed that information back to them and say, 37 people told us that if you don't fix this water fountain in such and such a park, <laughs> they're not going to keep going to that park. So you are able to feed back detailed information to them as well. So here is a map of the four, where the 44 participants in that last study completed audits. So you can see you can get a full picture. Uh, you can see the nine participating LGAs down here by the color code, and we can see where people did audits. So what you can see um, for this particular project is city centre and along the coast are spaces that a lot of people use. We know where a citizen scientist has ordered, audited or used spaces within their own LGA, but also where other people have come into that LGA. So we're able to divide that data up into residents and non-resident data and get an understanding of are residents going somewhere else to use someone else, another LGA's green spaces or are they using spaces within their own neighbourhoods? So just a little bit about the audit data that we've got, just to give you an idea of the sorts of things we can collect. So in the last project with the 44 participants during COVID, most audited spaces were nature reserves, water bodies, then public gardens and streetscapes. 44% of audits were in two kilometres of the home. Because we've geocoded their home address in that original survey, we then are able to map where, how far they go to access different spaces and how they got there. So we ask, are they intending to come back to this space and have they been there before? So we know about first visits, we know about intentions to come back again. We ask if it's a regular space, how often they come there? Do they go daily? Do they turn up weekly? Is it infrequently? Um, and then the reason for visiting. So in this case, nearly 60% of audits were about exercise. Um, I think we know a little bit about the space as well as the reason that they're there. So we know that spaces reported, people felt a sense of calm. They felt connected to their local area. They felt a sense of belonging in the space that they were in. And 51% of them were there as, in, in, as a desire to connect with nature. So we can tell a lot about the different spaces. We also collect basic information like, is there shade? Are there public toilets? Is there seating? All of those kinds of things. So we understand a bit about the physical space as well. And then of course, we've got the photographs. So as I said, for this project, about 50% of data was collected prior to COVID. 50% was collected during the first COVID shutdown when we really had no idea how long that was going to be for um, or what, what it was going to be like. So we had a really interesting understanding of how people felt about the use of being able to use green spaces during a particularly stressful time. Um, so here are some pre-COVID and post-COVID restriction data. So you can see that people use their streetscapes um, more often, they went to water bodies, which is beaches, rivers, lakes, more often. They went to nature reserves more often and national and conservation parks more often. But they did use public gardens and civic spaces less often. Um, and private green spaces, it shows that they use them less often, but in fact, that's a bit of a furphy because we only ask them to audit spaces once that's usually the first space people organize, uh, audit is there because it's a safe space to trial the audit tool out. So you can't really talk about how often they use their private spaces. In fact, some of the qualitative data 
told us how important those private green spaces were to people during that COVID time. Again, what were they using them for? So afterwards, walking the dog became more important during COVID than it was beforehand, lucky dogs. Um, to relax was about the same. Exercise increased exp exponentially during. So obviously that was one of the reasons we were allowed out of the house. So a lot of people were able to do that. But again, connecting with nature became more important post COVID as well. And here's a couple of other examples of comments people have put under their photographs and photographs they've taken during that COVID period. I talked a little bit about the fact that we geocode where people live and we geocode where they do their audits. And one of the things we're playing around with is that this gives us the ability to create life spaces, to get an understanding of how people use their neighbourhood. Um, and one of the interesting things that came out of the first study with older people was this idea of green corridors that most people ticked when we asked, what are you doing in this space? It was, I am on my way to somewhere else. And so we explored that a little bit in the interviews we did with people afterwards. And what we found was that people would link walks or access to the shops via green spaces. So it might be the little mini parks, the micro parks that people have. It might be particularly leafy greeny streets, or they walk through parks to be able to get to the bus stop or to the shops. So people were talking about creating green corridors for exercise and to access other things. They weren't necessarily spaces people were hanging out in. They were spending less than 15 minutes in each of these spaces. Um, so they weren't hanging out there, but they were appreciating them on a walk to somewhere else. So we kind of like the idea of maybe what we need is not more parks to go sit in, but more green corridors for people to use to get to other places. But the other thing we can tell is these life spaces, creating spider maps to tell us how people use their neighbourhoods and where they're accessing things as part of their everyday life. So where to from here? Well, we, as I said, we've got a couple of uh, projects in the pipeline. And ideally what we want to do is I did a lot of work in 2019 um, on a, a sort of international trip, engaging some people in the idea of creating an audit tool for age-friendly cities. The wonderful thing about the Esri tool is that it can be converted into 69 different languages. So you don't have to have a lot of work to create a uniform data tool that could be used worldwide. And we have some colleagues in Poland, Netherlands, Switzerland, Singapore, UK, Ireland, USA and Canada who are all ready to start trialling this audit tool once we've finished the co-design process with our local auditors and trialled it, we will get uh, all of our partners internationally and nationally to also co-design and trial it. Um, one of which is, um, as I mentioned before we began with CODA in Tasmania, are interested in co-designing and trialling this down in Tasmania. And we have colleagues in Brisbane who are interested in doing the same thing. So that will be our next step with the ideal of a global rollout. Um, and the reason we want to do that is age-friendly cities is a wonderful concept. It's a great program that's been rolled out, but there is no data evidence lying behind it about how people use age-friendly cities and age-friendly communities compared to other cities and communities. So we want to be able to shore up an age-friendly cities principles with data that we can evaluate and work with. So that is kind of where I'm at, Yvonne, if you want to um, take over again. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Helen, um, for sharing your experiences of using the citizen science approach um, to address this issue. It's what a fantastic project and you've shared so many um, important reflections and tips that I think will be really helpful for others in this um, session who might already be leading citizen science projects or who are thinking about using this approach in the future.